So Smash Bros Ultimate is here. It's literally a few days away. But in all of the anticipation for this game in the past few months, I found myself thinking that after Ultimate, things could be changing quite a bit for the next Smash game. For now, everyone is here, but what would the game look like instead if we only got 35 characters? That's just about half of our total roster right now. So sit back, grab your salted popcorn, and get prepared to yell into your screen as you see your favorite characters get snapped out of existence. This is the Smash Bros. Roster Reset. Let's jam. <laughs> Now I know what you may be thinking, there is a very easy starting point, the original 12. And you'd be right, these 12 characters have been in every single Smash Bros, and it's hard to see any of them being replaced even if this series was rebooted. They are the founders, they've been ingrained into Smash Bros culture from the very beginning, so it's really hard to take any of them out, and thus they all have to make the roster. And now things get interesting. <laughs> Bowser was introduced in Smash Bros. Melee. He was even given a prominent role on the very cover of the box, which was a very grand entry for himself to the series. Many even wonder how he missed out on being in the original game. A little known secret though is that Bowser was actually on pace to be in Smash 64. However, he was eventually cut later on into development. Back during the time of the Smash 64 website, Sakurai himself was fielding questions and answered this one from a user. Hello, I love Smash. My friend told me that there are two super hidden unlockable characters, Bowser and King DDD. Is this true? And Sakurai answered, no, it's not true. But we did actually work on them and they were partially complete at one point in time. So we have Sakurai confirming there, but it goes even further as Shigeru Miyamoto even went as far to confirm Bowser in an interview before the game launched. Who are some of the characters? Of course, Mario, Luigi, Bowser, and Donkey Kong will be in it. So from that we can gather that Bowser wasn't just an afterthought. He probably made it far into development but was likely cut at the last minute either due to time constraints or system capabilities. Bowser is iconic enough to earn his spot in the roster though, even without these interviews vouching for him. He's been the antagonist to Mario for 30 plus years now. He's an extremely well known character with a place in video game history and one of the biggest villains Nintendo has to offer, sealing his spot on this roster. Go Charizard! The Pokemon trainer debuted in Smash Bros Brawl and is an easy character to make an argument for. The trainer brings a unique mechanic different to any other character in the game by having the 3 in 1 swap system. Now the trainer is pretty much the avatar of the Pokemon franchise, the person you're playing as in all of the games. The particular trainers in the Smash universe though are red and green, with red being probably the most iconic of all trainers as far as the games go. Red is very much a legacy character along with the memorable Kanto starter Pokemon. Charizard is to this day still one of the most popular and recognizable Pokemon to ever exist. He's not on the same level as Pikachu, but very often even people outside of Pokemon and video game fandom will still be able to identify Charizard. It would be almost a crime for him to not be included and the trainer allows us to fit three characters into just one slot. Combine the legacy along with the versatility and uniqueness and you've got one surefire guaranteed roster spot. And then next up is Greninja who debuted in Smash 4. Now personally I would rather not give another slot to Pokemon as again I'm all about roster balance. But Pokemon probably needs someone from the modern era to represent them as well since the list is very Kanto and old school heavy. I would have preferred to possibly drop Jigglypuff and have Greninja absorb her slot but she's again an origin member and pretty much untouchable. And if any series warrants the most characters, to me it is Pokemon since after all it is the highest grossing media franchise of all time. I suppose that comes with its own perks. But back to Greninja, he quickly became the modern fan favorite. Fans absolutely fell in love with his design and with the rise to glory in the anime he became even more popular when paired up with Ash. Even going as far as to get an Ash hybrid form in the anime which was quite the surprise to many people. And that very form has even made it into the game in Smash Bros Ultimate. Back in 2016, Japan even held a poll to crown the most popular Pokemon. Over 500,000 people voted and you guessed it, Greninja took home first place. 
with, as you can see, both Pikachu and Charizard from earlier making it into the top six. Now Greninja without a doubt got a heavy handed boost due to the fact that this vote took place right in the midst of the last season of Pokemon XY, of which Greninja was playing the star role. But that aside, it's undeniable how popular Greninja is, and again, since he is a Pokemon, he offers a unique moveset that no one else in Smash can replicate at the current time. Greninja, more so than Lucario or Incineroar, seems like the best choice to represent modern Pokemon. Ganondorf made his entrance to the series in Smash Bros. Melee and has been a fan favorite ever since his arrival. Ganondorf has an extremely loyal fan base even in the competitive community despite the fact that he's never been ranked highly on any of the tier lists. Often he's rated even below most of the cast. However, Ganondorf has been facing off against Link for 30 plus years now, very similarly to the dynamic between Bowser and Mario. Now in my opinion, Ganondorf has been a character that has been underutilized as far as his moveset goes ever since his entrance into the Smash Bros series, but it is now finally getting a bit diversified with Ultimate. He as a character has amazing moveset potential to go along with his rich gaming history as he has appeared in over 36 video games since his debut, quite the feat and he remains as one of the most iconic villains that Nintendo have in their arsenal, certainly earning his spot on the roster. Stow your fear. It's now or never. And of course we need to complete the entire Triforce. We have Zelda who also debuted in Smash Bros. Melee. These three characters perfectly represent what The Legend of Zelda is all about and they all deserve to get in given how big of a series Zelda is to Nintendo being their fourth most selling series of all time. Zelda has many crafty abilities, she's one of the few magic users we have in Smash Bros and her moveset provides cool expression with Din's fire and the Phantom Summon. Zelda is no slouch herself for game appearances as she's appeared in even more games than Ganondorf. She is certainly no damsel in distress either as she is capable of holding her own out on the battlefield. She is the perfect piece to round out the Zelda trio and has without a doubt earned her right on the Smash Battlefield. Diddy Kong first catapulted onto the scene in Smash Bros Brawl and has been a top competitor ever since arriving. His first video game appearance was all the way back in 1994 in Donkey Kong Country and he's been by Donkey Kong's side ever since then. However, Diddy was such a huge hit with the fans that he even starred as the main character in the sequel Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy Kong's Quest. And he's even gotten his own spin-off game in Diddy Kong Racing which was a huge fan favorite as well. Donkey Kong is certainly more iconic, but Diddy isn't lagging too far behind these days to his best buddy. His playstyle is also vastly different compared to Donkey Kong, so having them both together in the game doesn't create any staleness. Diddy has proved he's more than just some ordinary second banana, and he definitely deserves a roster spot. The statement better late than never applies to how fans feel about Ridley, who's finally made his entrance in Super Smash Bros Ultimate. He should have arguably made his entry long before, but due to air quote size issues, he's only now joining the fray. He is without a doubt the most iconic villain in the Metroid series. He has many, many forms, Meta, Mecha, Omega, Proteus, freaking Neo, and even more, you get the point. Western fans have been yelling at the top of their lungs for him to join the battle and they finally got their wish. Ridley certainly fits the bill as an iconic villain and after thoroughly and brutally decimating both Mario and Mega Man in his reveal trailer, I'd say that grants him a ton of extra bonus points and street credit. Ridley vs Samus seems like the perfect way to round out the small yet important Metroid cast. Know my power. Now Meta Knight made his debut in Smash Bros Brawl and it was one that will never be forgotten. His dominance over that game guarantees him a slot on the roster. Brawl was Meta Knight's kingdom and it wasn't even close. Meta Knight was even deemed so good of a character that he was banned for a brief period of time in competitive play. Even though King DDD is more prominent in Kirby history, I had to give Meta Knight the nod over him just simply due to how dominant his role was in Smash Bros Brawl. 
As far as I'm concerned, Meta Knight is ingrained into Smash Bros history because of the stranglehold he exerted in that game. Even though Meta Knight isn't as relevant as King DDD, that doesn't mean he's some slouch. He is still part of the Kirby Core 4 and has been a vital member for many years now. He still has deep history in the series. Combine that with his brawl dominance and it's a combination that people in the Smash community will never forget. Meta Knight without a doubt has forcefully taken his spot on the roster. Apologies King. You're supposed to shoot them all! Spaces, a term you've probably heard if you've played Smash for a while. Falco debuted in Smash Bros. Melee and was quickly promoted to a fan favorite as well as one of the best characters in the game. Falco is probably most known for his dickish behavior throughout the Star Fox series, but it was one that people really gravitated towards. Gee, I've been saved by Fox, how swell. He is seen as one of the most reliable members in Team Star Fox, which certainly adds to his popularity. Falco held top tier status in back to back games in Melee and Brawl, giving fans a lot of exposure to him as he was seen in tournament play all the time before fading into absolute irrelevancy with Smash 4. Fox and Falco are almost inseparable at this point in the minds of Smash fans. Originally starting out in Melee with incredibly similar character designs, with each passing game they've been able to differentiate themselves just a bit more and definitely both have clear identities at this point. Falco rounds out the Star Fox crew. We'll each need to take down about 10. I'm sure you've all been waiting for this. Fire Emblem. Okay, let's do this. Now in terms of Smash, there is one Fire Emblem character that is at the top and earned his spot. It's no surprise, it's Marth. He debuted in Smash Bros. Melee which helped catapult Fire Emblem to newfound popularity. I cannot take him out of the Smash roster. He just has too much Smash Bros. history. Marth has been towards the top of the tier list in every single Smash game he has been in. He has always been viable giving him a lot of exposure over the years. I fondly remember kids back in the day trying their best to utter his famous Japanese catchphrases from Melee. Now personally I like Roy more but I cannot deny Marth the spot. He has just without a doubt earned it more. Even aiding the King of Smash Ken Hoang to take his long and dominant reign back in the early life of competitive Melee. Marth is draped in Smash Bros history. He oozes it. Regardless of anything that exists in the Fire Emblem universe, he has earned his place in Smash history. Now even I know Fire Emblem deserves another roster slot. And I wanted to make that character as different from Marth as possible so we could have varying playstyles. Which is why I've chosen Robin who first debuted in Smash 4. Robin is way more unique than any of the other Fire Emblem characters as they introduce the element of magic. And from what I know, Robin is supposed to be an incredibly skilled strategist within the realms of Fire Emblem, which again is about adding that diversity. Marth and Robin provide the perfect balance and mix for the Fire Emblem entries, one with mainly sword and one with magic. One a legacy and vintage character with Marth and one to represent the modern era of Fire Emblem with Robin. They provide the balance and diversity that I'm looking for in the Fire Emblem characters and as far as I'm concerned, both earn a spot on this roster off the back of their series legacy and for Marth, Smash Bros history. Mr. Game & Watch is hitting the 9 to secure his spot on the roster. He originally debuted back in Melee and has stuck around in all Smash iterations since. Now Game & Watch is a really easy choice for one of the retro reps as the Game & Watch series is actually still the 6th most selling Nintendo franchise of all time. Mr. Game & Watch is an incredibly unique variation of so many of the games from that series. He's a character that encapsulates the series so well and is full of gaming history. Game & Watch is actually also the oldest series represented in Smash Bros, even older than both Pac-Man and Mario. That certainly adds some extra points in his favor. Game & Watch probably has one of the most unique movesets in all of Smash Bros, and even though he hasn't been at the top of any tier list, it's not all about that. He certainly earned his spot in Smash with his legacy. We'll win this! I know we will! Pit charges into the roster making his debut back in Smash Bros Brawl. Now unlike most of the Smash cast, Pit does not have many video game appearances outside of Smash. He's been in just a few games. However, Brawl was sort of his revival in a sense. After all, he had not appeared in a major role in a game for 17 years prior to making it into Brawl, and he quickly became one that people remembered. 
Sakurai even pushed his revival further by going on to develop Kid Icarus Uprising after his revival in Brawl, and Uprising did fairly well for itself as overall it sold well and is a really fun game. So as far as I'm concerned that is something to be respected. Coming back from a 17 year grave to notoriety and popularity and even achieving a mainline game afterward, Pit and Kid Icarus definitely deserve a roster slot here. I just wish I could hand one out to Palatate as well. A moment of silence as we pour one out for the goddess. Now I hope I don't catch too much flack for this one, but Isabelle designs her way into a roster slot. She's making her debut just now in Smash Bros Ultimate, and she is one of the newer characters to make it onto the list as her debut in Animal Crossing was only 6 years ago in Animal Crossing New Leaf. And to me, this is a good thing as we do need modern representation to help balance the game along with the older characters. And I think if anyone is being honest with themselves, it's pretty clear to see that Isabelle is now the most popular Animal Crossing character in today's time. She has become the face of the series and for that reason I am putting her in the list over Villager. Isabel is incredibly popular in both Japan and the West, and Animal Crossing is still one of Nintendo's biggest franchises out there right now, and it isn't going away anytime soon. Isabel can sit comfortably in this roster, knowing she's earned her way here. Now the Wii was a phenomenon for Nintendo. It still ranks as one of the top 5 most selling home consoles of all time. It made massive waves for the company and really launched them forward back then. Therefore I feel the Wii specifically needs a rep and I decided to go with Mii Gunner. Now since the Mii fighters occupy their own slots in the roster I couldn't give them a 3 in 1 like the Pokemon trainer. No cheating this time. And I think Gunner is just my favorite of the Mii's so that's why I made the choice. Now if you want to substitute Gunner with either of the other two, that's fine. But I think the Mii's perfectly represent what came to be in the Wii era more so than Wii Fit Trainer does. Your identity is your me, and Mii's were so groundbreaking for Nintendo, they're still going strong 10 years later. I think without a doubt you have to go with one of the Mii fighters in this case, even though the Wii Fit series sold so well. I don't think the Mii's will be replaced in Nintendo systems anytime soon. Talk about impact. Shulk is another character that will serve as modern representation for Nintendo. He first debuted in Smash 4 and is roaring back in Smash Ultimate. His game Xenoblade Chronicles debuted just back in 2010, but the Xenoblade series has hit a great stride with the recently released Chronicles 2, and I think this series has justified itself at least one roster slot. It certainly will be a series that's around for many more games in the future, and Shulk is where it all began for this new series, and I think he makes a great rep. He brings the utilization of the Monado arts, which is something that other sword users certainly can't say for themselves. This unique mechanic makes him a breath of fresh air for Smash Bros, having the ability to go into different forms and alter his playstyle mid-match on the fly. Shulk will really be feeling it to know that he secured a slot for both himself and the Xenoblade series. This next spot shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, Inklings splat their way into the roster. They're just now making their Smash debut in Smash Ultimate, and Splatoon is one of Nintendo's newest and most successful IPs on the market right now. Splatoon made a huge splash selling incredibly well for both the original and the sequel, and it's looking to be one of Nintendo's long standing IPs from here on out. That alone is a big boost for them, but when you add in their unique moveset into the equation as well, it's clearly a no brainer. And something Inkling has going for them are new weapons are constantly being added to Splatoon. Their moveset still has limitless possibilities for any future iterations of the game. The squids are very much to the new kids on the block, but I think they are without a doubt one of the most popular new entries to Smash and have earned their spot. Ice Climbers is a choice that really shouldn't surprise anyone. They made their debut back in Smash Bros Melee and have been a household name in the Smash community since. They are very much a retro rep, with their original game debuting back in 1985 and then not appearing in another game until Melee 16 years later. Now Ice Climbers became infamous for their grabs and created the term wobbling, an act which could lock your opponent in a grab from any percent and pretty much seal their fate. And in Brawl, even though their wobbling was done though, they still kept an infinite chain grab combo to death once more, keeping them towards the top of the tier list and still remains as one of the most frustrating characters to ever play 
against in Smash Bros. Now they were missing from Smash 4, but that was most likely due to limitations of the 3DS more than anything about the Ice Climbers themselves. They are part of Smash Bros. legacy with their wobbling and chain grabs to death as much as I hate to say that, they just simply cannot be replaced and have definitely earned their spot. Show him what you got, Mac, baby. Little Mac punches his way to secure a spot. He first debuted in Smash 4 and he has one giant thing going in his favor. He's a vanguard and truly the first of his kind since he was the first character to be upgraded from assist trophy status to a playable character. This is something that shouldn't be underestimated as if he never makes that jump, who knows if Dark Samus or Isabelle ever make the real roster either. His Smash legacy was cemented by being the first character to do so. And even outside of Smash, Little Mac is an iconic character. Punch-Out is a game that is a household name. Mac is very recognizable to all gamers, not just Smash fans. And though the Punch-Out series hasn't had a new entry lately, it doesn't tarnish Mac's legacy at all. <laughs> Wario comes in and steals a slot on the roster. His Smash debut was back in Smash Brawl and it was seen as a long time coming for most Smash fans. In fact, in Sakurai's responses on the Melee website back then, he noted that if he had time to develop one more character, then Wario would have been the one to make it in. So he just barely missed out on Melee. Now Wario is a Nintendo veteran. He made his debut all the way back in 1992 with Super Mario Land 2. He's been in tons of games since then, and I mean tons of them. He's pretty much a staple now in every single Mario spin-off game, and on top of that, he has his own mainline series as well. This greedy antagonist really hits the mark for a lot of people, and has the Nintendo history to back himself up and justify his roster spot. Me the wrong way. You're too slow. Now similar to Little Mac, these two characters are vanguards as well as they were the first of their kind, being the first third party characters to make it into the Smash Bros series. When they made their debuts back in Smash Brawl, they set an incredible precedent that is still going on today. You've already guessed it, we are talking about Sonic and Snake. Now whether you like third parties or not, Smash is beyond the point of no return now and they are a part of Smash history. And these two characters paved the way for all of it to happen. They are both gaming icons. Sonic is without a doubt more recognizable than Snake to people outside of the gaming realm, but Snake is certainly no slouch himself. These characters ooze gaming history. Snake got his start in the late 80s and Sonic burst onto the scene in the early 90s. So they were fairly close to each other in debut time and have been kicking butt ever since their debut. Sonic's franchise has sold over 100 million copies and the Metal Gear series has sold over 50 million, placing them both in the top 100 most sold video game series of all time. So it's without a doubt they both have legacy. They both bring unique movesets naturally and a boatload of fans. And importantly they both have Nintendo legacy as well as they have many games that have been on Nintendo consoles. And again, a little known fact is that both of these characters would have most likely made it into Smash Bros. Melee if the timing was better. This was confirmed in two separate E3 interviews from the past, one by Sakurai himself confirming that Kojima called him begging to put Snake in Melee but the game was too far along to add him at that point, and Yuji Naka, the head of the Sonic team at the time, said that he spoke with Sakurai at E3 about adding Sonic into Melee but again Sakurai said the time left wasn't enough to reasonably add him. So these characters to me definitely earned their spot. They're both gaming icons and legacy characters and helped pave the way for a new era of Smash Bros. Now here it is, the last spot. And it's a spot I would love to hand over to none other than Cloud Strife. As far as I'm concerned, this is the pinnacle of what Sakurai has achieved in Smash. He managed to get a character that while certainly isn't the most iconic out of the Smash roster, it was certainly the hardest to obtain. Cloud in Smash Bros is something straight out of a fan fiction and is something that deserves to be appreciated. Sadly, I cannot hand him the slot, as there is someone that has to be recognized over him, and that's... Oh, another angel. Must have missed one. is Bayonetta. The slot belongs to her. 
It pains me to say that, but while Cloud is certainly miles more iconic than her, Bayonetta outshone him in Smash 4. She dominated that game. She cemented her legacy in Smash history, for better or for worse, with her insane combos and tournament play. She had people saying the famous quote, she doesn't even play like a Smash character. Smash 4 was her world and we were all just living in it. She is a character that even if dropped from the game completely, no one would ever forget the dominance and stranglehold she held over Smash 4. And that is why she has to be in, because she is simply unforgettable. A character that induced so much rage and salt and moments that cannot be forgotten. And she, air quote, supposedly won the Smash ballot, so that's gotta count for something, right? Bayonetta secures the last spot in style and will continue to be a thorn in our side as far as this roster is concerned. So that brings us to the end of the roster. Again, these were all just my own choices, but I think I was more than fair with choosing this list. I certainly excluded a lot of my own favorites like Toon Link and Zero Suit Samus, so I don't think I went into this with a biased approach. I tried to do this as objectively as possible. Still, it was a lot of fun and I'd love to hear what your guys' thoughts on this list are and what you would replace or change about it. Let me know down in the comments below. My Discord is always open as usual. The link will be in the description below for anyone that wants in. My previous videos should be somewhere on the screen right there. Check those out if you have some time. Don't forget to subscribe and notifications on for more future content. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.